And there's another stage of uh, the of, of um, Shakir Hassan al Said, which completely you you mentioned that this uh, transition between the 50s and then the the 70s and the 80s in, in your book. Can you explain yes. it, this trans, uh, transition in his work? So this comes from the later phase for Shakir Hassan uh, from 1965 onwards, uh, known as the one dimension, al Wahid, yeah. where he would uh, say that he was exploring that, and here I'm going to say it with extreme simplification, it's not really the words of Shakir Hassan, but for example, I understand it, and I could be wrong, but this is my understanding of it uh, based on having read his work and looked into several of uh, his paintings and studied his work for a, a long time, that he was looking to, uh, uh, let's say, if you were in the 1930s in terms of the art movement, looking into primitive art as a source of inspiration. So if we're looking into Gauguin, yeah. uh, and the paint, uh, paintings from uh, Tahiti, uh, Picasso and the painting, uh, the work of you know African art. In art, he was he was saying, if I come from a, a land of you know very steeped heritage like Islamic Mesopotamian etc., but at the same time I'm I am someone modern. So here he's talking within the same level of let's say Jawad Salim in 1951. Yeah, but now we are in a different time in a different era, and we want to reinvent. Uh, ourselves and we want to create something that is speak our time and here we're talking in the mid 60s uh, what what is what is there or what is more primitive what is more what is there before the painting that we know the painting which can be two-dimensional there is something before the two-dimensional which is a one-dimensional it's one dimension and this is the literally the surface. So there is no perspective. You're only dealing with the surface as one dimension. And the surface with whatever tracks and marks on it that can be spatio-temporal markers. Different things, different traces, different experiments, different emotions on that surface. It can connect you with a different uh, sphere, different, uh, let's say, level of knowledge or contemplation. Or at least it would be uh, a portal for you to contemplate your the, the environment or what is known as environmental art. So this kind of work, uh, al uh, it, it looked at uh, elements. One of these elements was the use of the uh, Arabic letter or the use of numbers or letters as uh, markers or as shapes of a certain identity and a certain culture. Here we have to know that he was not the first to look into Hurufiyya. He actually comes in a, possibly a second generation of people to look into Hurufiyya because the people who looked before him was Medina Omar in the late 1940s and uh, Jamil Hamoudi in the 1950s. And it was Jamil Hamoudi's idea uh, that uh, art is inspired by a letter, Al Harf, Al Fan Stelham Al Harf. Uh, which was the uh, slogan for the inaugural exhibition of this kind of work, you know, work inspired by uh, letters and words uh, in 1971. Uh, so here, what, when you look at this painting or this body of work of uh, Shakir Hassan, like the example you have behind you uh, from the Lul Art Foundation and anything in, in uh, 19... Uh, 80s, 90s, until he passed away in 2004, it is completely detached uh, from the work that he created before 1961. Oh, yeah. Obviously, we see that there is no representation, no figuration, uh, or figurative uh, representation in, in his work, but also the ethos is completely different. Uh, but again, in this ethos, he was bound to look into uh, marks and motifs that uh, signify his heritage, the Islamic and the Mesopotamian heritage. At the same time, he wants his work to be regionally, regionally accepted and internationally understood. And hence, we see these, uh, these two works. So here, in these two works, uh, they are known as the Lawhat al-Judran, uh, Judran as in the walls, because they look like, you know, 
concrete or cement uh, walls uh, in Baghdad in the 1960s, 70s. And he published you know, several of his articles and books where he showed examples. He was photographing a lot of these walls. And he was even photographing, for example, uh, tracks uh, on months. He ha there are some video recordings of lectures of his uh, at Dar al in the 1990s, where he was even looking at uh, uh, pictures uh, of the surface of uh, Mars and the surface of the moon and looking at the tracks on them and visually what they mean, or not what they mean, what they would inspire you uh, to do. So a lot of these works that you see from the wall, they look like as if you know, they're part of a wall that uh, yeah. was cut out and yeah. you know, put uh, for you on a frame. And you can see what's happening there it is happening by, you know, almost by accident uh, because there is no, I mean, you cannot sketch a work like this before you actually implement it. Yeah. But at the same time, when it is happening, it looks like as if it was an inevitable accident as if it was meant to be there. Uh, here, you're blending the concepts of time and space together. There, there are good let's say, uh, studies and essays by Neda Shabot on this, specifically um, uh, concepts by Shakir Hassan that I did not go into detail in my book, as in Al-Tajadar Al-Makani wa Al-Tajadar Al-Zamani. So uh, basically, um, it is like rooting your work into the spatial domain and the temporal domain, domain. and how we can uh, study this uh, um, in, in these work. Mm. So during the war between Iraq and Iran uh, from uh, 1980 to 1988, uh, Mohammed Makia's uh, office in London became a gallery. Uh, and in your book, you wrote, uh, part Particularly for exiled uh, Iraqis, the Kufa Gallery became the home of their identity and culture outside Iraq. Uh, can you tell us what was the scope of the, of, uh, the gallery? So the, the Kufa Gallery um, was uh, basically a, a private cultural uh, center uh, that was founded within the architectural office of Mohammed Makia in Westbourne Grove. Uh, in, in uh, London. And this gallery, in a way, exploited a sort of a vacuum. The vacuum was created by the closure of the Iraqi Cultural Center, which was the official center, um, in the 1980s due to the you know, limitation of funds during the Iraq Iran War. Uh, for example, the Al Azawi was the uh, cultural advisor for the Iraqi Cultural Center. Who, uh, uh, and, and they have produced several important exhibitions. In 1986, the Kufa Gallery started uh, to also do um, uh, talks, art exhibitions, and they specified you uh, doing the talks on Wednesday, uh, and because there is a tradition that during the Abbasid times as well, the talks or the seminaries used to be on Wednesday, so they wanted to carry out this, carry this tradition. Uh, Rose Asa was one of the first uh, artistic directors or directors of this space, the uh, Kufa Gallery. And they have organized uh, several important exhibitions uh, that are understudied, actually. It's, you know, we, we, there, there ought to be some sort of a study into the art exhibitions that happen in, in this space specifically, as well as the Iraqi Cultural Center uh, in the 1980s. So, here we see this private space which operated for 20 years without any, let's say, public funding or any uh, funding source per se. Uh, it, it worked on a very uh, simple uh, formula. The formula is that the space would hold a, a, an exhibition yeah. and uh, the artists would give a small percentage um, of the profits, uh, you know, whatever sales they make uh, from the in form of a painting. To Makia. And this was the second phase of how the Makia collection started to grow in 1986 uh, to 2006 to have a diverse works of art uh, just from this simple formula. You hold an exhibition in the space, we, you know, you're not charged money, but if you sell, then there is a small uh, proportion that you would give in kind in yeah. a form of thing. Uh, this is in addition to the fact that Makia himself used this. Uh, 
opportunity of you know holding exhibitions in a space to buy specific works of art to collect specific works of art as this work that we see from uh, uh, an important group ex exhibition of Rafa al Nasri, Saleh Jumi'i, and uh, Riyal Azawi uh, in uh, 1988 in Cooper Gallery. Yeah. Uh, and uh, here, obviously, you see this is a, a, a very uh, modern, striking work of Riyal Azawi when you put it in contrast with some of his earliest works from 1969, closer to the time of. Uh, the new group or the new movement, Ru'ya uh, Jadida, the new vision group. What I wanted to say about this work of Riyal Azawi, uh, these two works of Riyal Azawi, here you can see uh, an example of, for example, uh, an example of an artist broadening his horizon and changing his language according to the environment that he's in. So while the 1969 work is a work that's produced in Baghdad, part of the yeah. vision ethos, in 1988, Riyal Azawi mentions that when he came to London, he started to see um, works by other artists that are looking at different cultures. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are using their own culture here. You have to create a, a work of art that speaks to you, but at the same time, uh, it is accepted or it is understood by you know, a wider uh, international uh, community. So in this work of the 1988, you can see there are influences of Harufiya in a way. Yeah. Uh, you can see the movements or the, uh, what the illusions of, of a letter, but it is not an Arabic letter that you can discern. Yeah. And the, the palettes, the composition of the work is a, a very innovative as well, mm -hmm. uh, completely different from the earlier work. Um, Ismail Fattah also exhibited at the Kupa Gallery in London. Yes, and this work comes from uh, 1988, uh, where Ismail Fattah held a solo exhibition at the Kufa Gallery. And uh, here, th this is a, comes from a body of work of Ismail Fattah, the same uh, one uh, from, uh, that we see from the Lular Foundation 2003. This is a, a body of work or body of paintings uh, that evolved or became a new phase in the work of Ismail Fattah after he had completed the uh, the, the monument, the uh, uh, the uh, martyr's monument, Nasb al-Shaheed in Baghdad. According to Raf al-Nasri, who was a colleague, a contemporary of Ismail uh, Fattah, that um, the accomplishment of Ismail Fattah in terms of sculpture uh, into creating that uh, monument, the Martyrs Monument in Baghdad, left him overwhelmed. And that overwhelming feeling led him to uh, find a different way to channel his emotions and to channel um, uh, his, uh, uh, let's say, creativity into a different body of work. And this is what you can see in these, you know, style of paintings. Uh, that comes from 1980s until 2003, where there are paintings that he's studying the human condition uh, and the human condition that is sometimes trapped between uh, an inside environment and uh, an inside environment and an outside environment, especially when you put different things in context, uh, as in the Iraq-Iran war, um, the different socio-political movements that are happening in the Arab world at the time. Yeah. Um, they were truly affected by what was happening in Iraq at the time. Yes, yes. But here they're using basically uh, an, a language that is uh, uh, Arabic, they call it Tawriya. Tawriya, it is like a, a punning. So yeah. you are saying something which on the face of it me could mean something superficial, but there is a deeper meaning to it. And you have to uh, experience in a way or understand the conditions into which the work that was created in order to understand this underlying language uh, underneath it. So therefore, these works um, from 1980s, 1990s of Ismail Fattah, uh, they are very rich in a way uh, that they can have different interpretations. But on the face of them, they can be just visually aesthetic and pleasing. And they could be naively understood that, you know, they are just decorative 
maybe works of art. Yeah. And then uh, Faisal Laibi Sahi, you also worked on this uh, artist for your chapter on the Kufa Gallery. Yes, because in 1991, <clears throat> uh, Faisal Laibi, I think 1991 or 1990, Faisal Laibi moved uh, from Paris, where he used to live since the 70s, he moved to London. Yeah. And when he moved to London, he met Makia and he became a frequent contributor, a frequent visitor to the Kufa Gallery. And he held an exhibition, the Kufa Gallery, and one of these paintings uh, is Al Khayyata, yeah. uh, Interest, um, that is now in the, in the Makia collection. And what we understand or what we appreciate about Faisal Abi, Faisal Abi, he comes from uh, a certain, uh, uh, let's say, a certain branch within the Iraqi art movement. This branch is influenced by Fayyak Hassan and influenced by the uh, academic uh, tradition uh, uh, to painting. Uh, so for example, uh, Faisal Abi was part of the, the academics or the academic, academician group, uh, Jama'at al-Akademi with Kavim Haida and uh, Wali Sheet and uh, Salah Chiyad, uh, where you can see that they relied on their ac academic painting and their skills in yeah. academic painting to create a new reality and, and you know through that painting so it is in a sense realist but at the same time trying to use the academic uh, principles to fuse that realist tradition with uh, ethos of Baghdad modern art group in terms of modernism and this work in addition to the other uh, later work that you have in the, the Lula Art Foundation uh, gives you a glimpse on uh, Faisal Abi and the part, or let's say the group of artists he comes from and he represents within the Iraqi art movement. So we said earlier two things that, first of all, the Iraqi art movement, there were three competing groups at the formation of modernism, which is the realist uh, trend within the group of Rawad and Faik Hassan. Yeah. The modernist geometric Islamic etc trend in Baghdad modern art group and the other group the impressionists who were not very much impressionists but it was the name that they called themselves under half of the Ruby uh, and uh, Faisal Abi comes from this tradition he was taught and he learned under Faik Hassan because Joe Salim was not alive at the time so he has this realist tradition but at the same time he was very much drawn to uh, the ethos of Baghdad modern art group of merging your Islamic and Mesopotamian heritage into a modern work of art. We now understand easily that uh, uh, Faisal Abi uh, was part of a group known as the Academicians uh, Group, Jama'at al Akademi, with Kalam Haidar, Walid Sheet, and Salah Jiyad, where basically they, the, again, in a very simplistic way of putting it, that you would use the academic style in painting, uh, but uh, to still consider the ethos of Baghdad Modern Art Group to create a new reality. So it's like it's almost they're merging the two groups, uh, what uh, Fai Hassan was, stood for and what uh, Jawah Salim stood for in this uh, kind of work. So for example, in this seamstress uh, work that you see, uh, which can be seen as a, you know another uh, for example, a beautiful, simple work, but actually there are so many elements in it uh, that uh, Faisal Abi brilliantly built on with, with very much uh, a sense of simplicity uh, that, for example, the perspective in creating this work is influenced by al yeah. where You can see the flat perspective of the floor to the ceiling behind it. However, the formation of the, the figure that's sitting in front of you and certain elements in it are Mesopotamian. The, you know, the front gaze that you get from Sumerian uh, art, as well as the uh, unibrow, uh, you know, the joint uh, brow, which we see in uh, uh, different works that, uh, or different uh, artifacts in archeology span that come from Assyrian, uh, Assyrian uh, times, and the wide almond eyes. eyes was also, you know, yes, a Sumerian feature that we even see in the works of Henry Moore, for example. Um, and, 
again, looking at something that is local, but at the same time, it is international. So uh, the sewing machine, the Singer sewing machine, which is a famous uh, piece of uh, every household, yeah. that it is uh, local within the Baghdadi scene. It is very well recognized, but at the same time, it is a sewing machine used all over the world. So uh, he tried to make it uh, as simple as possible using a principle known in Arabic poetry. Uh, they call it al-sahl al-mumtana. It means uh, the, the the simple but imp, imp, uh, simple but not penetrable. Yeah. So it's it's like a, some it's like a monolith work that is very. Uh, uh, minimalistic in its approach, uh, but at the same time, it is very rich and one unit. So you see that in, in this beautiful work, The Seamstress. And obviously, he, he uh, widened that theme and he explored that theme widely in other works like the ca ca cafe houses, which are some of his you know, most important themes yes, yeah. uh, uh, that you know, he has. In addition to uh, employing the same realist uh, technique, the academic technique, to drawing uh, important. For example, uh, painting, uh, let's say, in, in, sorry, in addition to using um, academic and realist techniques in painting uh, important landmarks from the locale, as in this painting of Al Haydar Khana Mosque. So, if you remember earlier, we talked about the Haydar Khana Mosque as being not, uh, the mosque is not being only as a uh, a place of worship, but also as a cultural center. The Khan Mosque in uh, modern uh, history of Iraq stands out as not only a place of worship, uh, but it's also it was a political center, a cultural center, important uh, revolutions, uprisings, declarations, important poetry uh, came uh, from this uh, specific mosque, uh, which sits on, until today, on Ar Rashid Street, which is the most important street in uh, Baghdad or the old uh, part of uh, Baghdad. And now, if you look at this painting, it almost looks like a, a, a digital render of, uh, of a place. But obviously, this is because of his technique. Like, you know, uh, he is very gifted with his uh, technique, uh, Faisal Abi. And uh, uh, you, you get to appreciate that if you are as an artist trying to invent yourself, but at the same time being faithful to your teachers, Jawa Selim, Faik Hassan. Uh, then this would be uh, a possible solution. This would be a possible formula to uh, show this innovation at the same time being faithful to your past. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for uh, your participation and in introducing us to uh, modern uh, Iraqi art. Congratulations for your book. It's an amazing source of uh, research and I really appreciate it to, to read it also. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, Arthur, for giving me uh, this opportunity. Um, and I look forward uh, to um, visit the, the Lul Art Foundation collection because it's, again, one of the important collections that we have in the, in the art world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.